Hey everybody, JJ here. Welcome back for another Saturday of Zoom networking. Uh, excited again, it's Halloween weekend 2021. We've got none other than my good friend, Brian Fine on today. I'm so excited to hear what he has to say. We got a big group of people and we're rare, we're ready to go. Brian, how you doing today, brother? Hey, JJ, great to be here, man. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, making our lenders love us. We always think about taking their money, but we rarely take into account their point of view. So tonight, we're going to be going into that and looking at why do they lend us money and how can we get them to lend us more of it? So it should be Very a pretty cool, good brother. call. That is so cool. Uh, money, there's no better topic than money. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. And uh, with that, brother, um, microphone's yours. Take it away. Uh, so the idea tonight, we're going to talk about being bankable. Um, we always want to borrow money from lenders. We need it to fund our transactions, but we really don't think about them too much. We just think about them cutting a check. So tonight, we're going to flip the script and take a serious look at what makes them write that check to us in the first place. Uh, why do they do it? And maybe we want to do it too. And what, why would we want to do that? So, all right. So for those who don't know me, my name is Brian Fine. Uh, I've been around doing this for a little while here. We started real estate back in uh, 2012, uh, and we started out as residential flippers. We rehabbed stuff. We bought it. We fixed it. We sold it. Uh, we did enough of that to learn that we never wanted to do it again. Uh, stopped doing it, and now we're 100% focused on buy and hold passive income. So we buy entire real estate portfolios. We also sell portfolios to other investors. We've got quite a few of our investors here on this call. Uh, have picked up whole portfolios from us. And then, of course, we're looking to grow our own all the time as well. I am in business with my beautiful wife, Laura. Some of you guys might have actually done some coaching with her as well. And actually, a little surprise for JJ here. He doesn't know about this. But uh, uh, Laura and I were talking last night, and she is okay with taking on a, a coaching student or two. Just a few. Uh, if that is of interest to you, that would be a additional investment thing on the side. Talk to JJ about it. Tell him you're interested and he'll get you in touch and we'll figure that out. Okay. So not a lot, but she'll do a little bit of that. Uh, we have a passive uh, passion for combative martial arts. I just came back from a third degree black belt test today for one of our students. So we beat the hell out of him for a little while. So we love doing that stuff. Uh, and my wife and I are also a manufacturer and uh, instructors of firearms. So we have a lot of fun doing that stuff. So now you're all caught up. You guys know who I am. Hopefully you all know who this guy is. Mr. Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha. If we don't find a way to make money while we sleep, we will work until we die. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like a pretty crappy deal. So I'm going to have to figure out how to make cash while we sleep. And that in my world is what we focus on. True passive income. How do we make money while we sleep? All right, so we threw together this thing, and this is the evolution of a real estate investor or a food chain, if you want. At the bottom of, the, uh, of our little food chain or evolutionary ladder, we have motivated sellers. Those things are like grass. Everybody wants to eat them. Uh, try never to be a motivated seller. It's a really crappy place to be in your life, both uh, emotionally and financially. And those are the people that we go after as real estate investors kind of across the board. Uh, next step up is to be a wholesaler. We don't actually close on the property. We aren't the one writing the check. We aren't taking any possession of the asset. We simply get equitable interest and then sell that interest off and uh, get paid for it. Then rehabbers, I know we got a lot of rehabbers on this call. We're going to buy it, fix it, and sell it for the uh, equity we've created. So generate our profit that way. And wholesaling and rehabbing are great businesses, and they are active businesses. They are high-paying jobs that you create for yourself. And then we got landlords. Landlords buy it, keep it, and make other people pay them to live in it. So those properties start generating income then, and we get a whole host of other benefits from it. That is more passive, not completely. We'll need a third-party management company to really cut down on the work there. And at the top of the food chain, the ones who make all the rules are the lenders. That is as high in our world as you can get. They get to make all the choices, they have all the freedom, and their position is the most passive, right? So in my world, this is where I want to be. I want to be a landlord, and I want to be a lender. I'm not as interested in that other stuff. There's nothing wrong with rehabbing and wholesaling, great businesses, uh, but those are active businesses. And if we want to make money while we sleep, they aren't on the docket. 
All right, so what makes a lender lend? If you can't imagine being a lender, how can you understand them? How can you give them what they want to see, tell them what they want to hear at all? All right, so we're going to talk about that some. And then uh, something, I, I just threw this in here. It's kind of out of context, but uh, 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 this comes up everywhere. Everybody wants to do a $0 deal. You want to have no skin in the game, right? You just want to be able to do as many transactions as you want with no risk to yourself. Uh, in every deal, somebody somewhere is going to have to write a check. And I am lame enough to be quoting myself on that, because I don't know of anybody else who said it. Uh, the idea is that it doesn't matter if you got 100% financing. Somebody had to write the check for that 100% financing. It doesn't matter if you got a subject to deal and the seller is going to carry the, uh, the mortgage. They had to get that financing. That check was written. Somebody has to take on the financial responsibility for the transaction every single time. That person will be a lender. Whether or not it's you, that depends on the transaction. But $0 deals, while doable, do not make your life easier. It's much easier to not have to do it with $0 and be allowed to have some skin in the game. If that's not an option, then we're going to have to find some other solutions to the problem. All right. So why lenders lend? Uh, there's two major reasons. This is the first one. According to the Federal Reserve, 86% of the $16 trillion uh, global bond market yields no higher than 2%, with more than 60% of that at less than 1% as of this summer. So this little chart here is basically the majority of the world's debt. It's uh, about $14.6 trillion. And... You can see the, the, the bottom of that chart there, that pink section, that's the 2% return annually. And that makes up over 60% of all debt on the, in the bond world. Okay, so this, this is most of the debt in the world. And very little of it goes past that. All right, And so what basically tells us is bonds, which are uh, fiat-based uh, uh, investment vehicles, are considered the most conservative thing there is, and they don't pay enough at all. And there's significant downward pressure on them. They're, and there's actually quite a few. They're not even on this chart. They're at negative inflation or negative uh, interest, as in they will pay you to take them. So um, most of the debt in the world is super, super cheap. And then we have inflation. It's Halloween, guys. So uh, let me go ahead and scare you. Unfortunately, this is not a joke. According to our friends at the Federal Reserve, inflation is currently running at 5.4%. Uh, and that is a really rosy picture. The number that they use for that is called CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And it's an equation that's calculated off a whole bunch of expenses that they say every family has to give you an average of idea of the buying power of your US dollar. Uh, they have calculated that. They've changed the equation. They still call it CPI, but they've changed the equation three times. Uh, since 1980. And 1980 was the original, it was kind of unredacted. Uh, they changed it up in 1990. And what that did is made the numbers a little rosier, same data, but but lower number. And they did it again in the uh, mid 2000s. Uh, so the number you see today uses the same data as in 1980, but comes up with a 5.4%. What you're seeing on these little charts here, the red line is what the Federal Reserve tells us inflation is, or CPI is, today. The blue line is what it is if we take the exact same data and apply it to the math from 1980 or 1990, before they started making the numbers sexier. So in 1980, we'd be riding around 14% inflation for the year. And in 1990, it would be about uh, right around 9 instead. So inflation is essentially a loss of buying power of our money. And uh, as investors, we normally consider it a bad thing. There, uh, when we're buy and hold investors or borrowers, it actually works for us. But uh, as lenders, this is usually a bad thing. This is what they're trying to fight. They need to get annual returns in excess of this uh, in order to be uh, profitable. Otherwise, they are losing their shirts just by waiting. So if you have a lot of cash sitting around or it's sitting in a retirement account, for example, and you aren't getting an annual yield, of, you've got to decide what you believe inflation is. Uh, if you believe the Fed, you've got to be getting over 5%, probably closer to 6 And if you believe the Fed from 30 years ago, which was a little less uh, political, 
then uh, you probably need to be getting closer to uh, nine or 15% instead. And if you're not getting that, then your account, your balance and net worth are shrinking, uh, at least as far as uh, net worth goes. So lending institutions have this problem in spades. We love talking about, it's a, a, a common uh, investor bar conversation is, if I could just make $100 million in principle and I could go ahead and invest that in something that'll make me 10% back a year, I'd have my $10 million a year and I could live like a king and queen and never have to worry about anything again and I'd be a happy person. What gets omitted in that conversation is there's not a lot of conservative investment vehicles out there that can pay a double digit return uh, be secured so that if anything goes wrong, you don't take a total loss on it and handle $100 million. That's a really big investment. But even at smaller numbers, 100,000, 200,000, a million, there's not a ton of vehicles out there that can handle uh, that kind of a return. And so what we're left with, the favorite one for everybody, bonds don't work. I just showed you that one, right? You're looking at 2% for most of it. There's, there's a lot of competition in that market and plenty of that is uh, actually negative. So you'd have to pay somebody to take your money in bonds, which is kind of crazy. So that doesn't work as an investment vehicle anymore. Uh, the volatility in the stock market is way, way too uh, much for, for most of us who are looking to uh, retire and we want to bet our life on it. Uh, so generally, we don't want to handle that. And that leaves us with the mortgage-backed security market or uh, real estate. It's the only one left in the game that gives us a pretty secure asset that can potentially pay those returns and high enough to offset inflation. So that, in essence, is why lenders lend. All right, so debt market forces. Uh, first thing we just said, debt is cheap. Again, you can, you can pretty safely throw around the stat that 60% of the world's death, debt is worth less than 2%. Debt is cheap. Okay, that, that is your return on that. Uh, inflation is causing constant losses. They need to not just offset those losses, but in really big dollar amounts are huge institutions that have billions and billions of people's capital. Uh, they need to make money on top of that. So they're chasing yield. Is the, is the term they get used in the uh, two and 20 financial crowd. They, they want to get a reliable return. And this is causing significant downward pressure in the lending industry because all of those other vehicles aren't working nearly as well anymore. Our Wall Street hedge fund guys uh, who used to not bother uh, playing with us little peasants who couldn't do anything at less than uh, $5 billion per transaction, suddenly the single family housing market has become extremely interesting to them because it's the last frontier where they can get returns that will offset their inflationary problems. It's the only place they can be. And them entering the market suddenly has the banks and the credit unions who had no competition before. Now, they got to fight these guys because there's only so many people out there who will take a mortgage. And so the market forces, how many mortgages can they write? And that is leading to lower rates for us, better terms for us, uh, better closings. So as investors, this is good stuff. It is absolutely unsustainable in the long term. Uh, but for the next couple of years, uh, we're, we're in a kind of a golden age to borrow every penny we can get our hands on. All right, the capital stack. Let me talk about this real quick. The capital stack is how every single deal is funded. And it works from the bottom to the top. It doesn't matter if I'm buying a shack for 50 bucks uh, or a skyscraper for a couple billion dollars. We're going to have the same stuff going on every time. Part of the purchase price and transactional cost of that is going to be covered by senior debt. That is a first position mortgage. Uh, that can be a bank, a credit union, uh, or in the case of somebody buying cash, uh, we don't even use the senior debt position. If there is a gap lender, so maybe a bank has given us 70% and I got somebody else coming in for 20%, uh, that is called mezzanine debt. That is a second position lender. And there can be second, third, fourth, there can be a bunch of different positions there. But everyone after the first is called mezzanine. 
Then we have preferred equity. We'll talk more about that one in a couple of minutes. And then we have common equity, and that's what you have as an owner. So if you put, uh, if you're buying the deal, and let's say uh, a, a lender is giving you 70% of the purchase price on that, let's pretend the house is $100,000. We're gonna, uh, banks can give us 70K. We're gonna be expected to stroke a check for 30 and pay the closing costs, probably about five grand. Uh, so the 35,000 we put in the deal will be considered common equity. So the ones that you guys are going to deal with the most often are senior debt and common equity. That's the, the simplest model of uh, most transactions. You guys who are flipping houses, that's probably what you're doing. You're going to use a senior debt, probably a hard money lender, and then have common equity for your own skin in the game. Okay. These other two, the mezzanine and the preferred equity, are how we get to zero dollars in. It's also how we can reduce our down payment. They make it more expensive and they are higher risk positions. So the lenders involved are going to have different motivation. All right. So I threw together this little chart here, and this is where I'm going to spend the majority of my time. Uh, Mark Abramovich is on this call. Mark is a uh, hard money lender. If you guys haven't dealt with him yet, you probably should. He's a very good one. Uh, he's also a uh, private lender, and he is a real estate buyer. He's, he's picking up a portfolio off of me in the next week or two, whenever we can get around to closing it. Uh, so he is going to audit what I'm telling you here. And if I'm full of it, he's going to jump in and tell me how dumb I am and correct us, okay? So we have three major types of lenders out there. Uh, institutional lenders, that's our banks, credit unions, really, really big guys. We have our second tier lenders. These are our hard money lenders, uh, certain hedge funds, and professional uh, smaller lenders, right? And then we have our private lenders at the end. The way they underwrite their deals is super important to us. New investors get way caught up on what are the terms? How much interest are they charging me? Uh, guys, let me shave about 10 years off your real estate education. Stop caring about that. Points and interest are the last thing you should give a shit about. What we care about is the underwriting. What is it going to take for them to write the, the check? Not what's the check cost. How do we even get to the point where we can get the deal? All right. So with banks, with our institutional guys, they're going to want a guarantor. That's you, probably. They're going to want an asset. They're going to have rules for what that ha asset has to look like. And, uh, where it has to be located, how much it can be, what kind of construction, if any, they're willing to accept, what kind of income it has to generate. So they're going to underwrite that too. And they're going to do that at what we call full doc. I will talk about that in a couple of minutes, but basically it means we're going to have to give them all the paperwork. It's the full financial cavity search. And then they are going to decide whether or not to write this note more on the guarantor than they are on the asset. Meaning, if the deal is great and the borrower is iffy, they're not going to write the loan. Okay. Uh, for cost, you can get them to do uh, usually between 50 and uh, at the very high end, you can get them up to about 85%. Uh, that's, you, that's a HUD-backed loan. Right? Their speed is slow as hell uh, with a side of not in a hurry. You have no leverage. They don't care. They're going to take their time. Uh, they will generally not allow a mezzanine debt position. So you're not going to be using your gap lender, uh, not with a bank, not normally. And uh, uh, something I didn't put on here, but is really, really important to understand is how these guys get paid. When they write a mortgage, they get paid on the transaction. It's not the mortgage itself. They're going to sell that for no profit. They're going to sell it for exactly what they have into it. Uh, on, a, on another market, on the mortgage security market. What they're going to get paid on is the transaction cost. And in banks, they don't usually call them points, but they're point. Uh, origination fees, admin fees, uh, whatever else they come up with, but it'll total out to uh, a couple of points worth of uh, fees, and that's how they get paid. So that's all they care about. They don't actually care about your mortgage or how big it is. It's important to understand that about your loan officer. All right, second tier lenders, our hard money guys. All right, call and talk to Mark. You can learn how they think. 
they're going to care about the guarantor and they're going to care about the asset and they can do that. There's a bunch of different kinds, but they can do it at full doc or low doc, meaning instead of full financial cavity search, it's more of a, hey, uh, do you have this or not kind of thing. It's, it's a little bit easier, lighter, simpler to get through. And it's weighted more on the asset. So if the borrower is iffy and the asset is good, the bank would not write you the loan, but the hard money lender probably would. They would just give you crappier terms. Uh, as for your loan to cost, you're going to get that anywhere between 50 and 90%. So you're going to... Uh, the 90% is uh, uh, actually kind of cool. When I was doing rehabs, we had to be into them for a lot more, but there are a whole bunch of hard money lenders out there that will give you 90% of purchase and 100% of rehab right now. So that's a kind of a beautiful thing. So you, you, uh, you rehabbers out there have, have it a little easier than I do back when I had to walk uphill both ways in the snow. Right? And then we have our private lenders, or wait, I'm sorry, speed of your hard money lenders. Uh, they're pretty quick. It's usually appraisal time plus a week or two. So uh, fairly fast compared to a bank. And you can leverage them and yell at them to go faster. They're used to it. Uh, they will tell you if you ask them if you can have a second position, they will usually say no. And then if you talk to them for a little while, they'll, they'll him and haw, and then they'll get into how you can get away with it. Uh, they will usually allow some kind of owner financing, uh, but they're still going to want to see you have 10% skin in the game. And if you go that route with them, they're going to get real picky about where that 10% came from. So basically have that in a checking account somewhere if you're going to go that route. Uh, if they allow a second position, there'll be rules about how they go about it. And we'll talk more about underwriting in a few minutes. All right. And then we got private lenders. Uh, the private lenders, their underwriting is the guarantor, and the asset at low doc or no doc. Low doc meaning they might ask for a couple of documents. No doc meaning they don't ask you for anything except their loan documents. And it is weighted pretty close to 100% on the relationship. Private lenders do not typically lend based on the asset or even on the guarantor. It's based on who you are as an individual. All right? As for how much they will lend you, it's somewhere between nothing and all of it, including the closing costs how fast they can move, it's uh, how fast their money moves, uh, whatever source of capital they are using. Uh, so it's basically title clearing speed. And then uh, will they allow second position? Most of the time they are the second position when that happens. Uh, so the, they're the ones who are acting for that. They can also just take down the entire deal and you wouldn't need a second position. So that's your major kinds of lenders. All right, here's where Mark's gonna yell at me if I'm wrong. Full doc underwriting. These are the things you better have ready to go for your lenders. You should all put together this package. So be ready to go for full doc, even if we're not going to use it. You're going to have a hard FICO check. If your personal FICO score is not above 680, you're going to have a hard time getting a loan. You're way better off over 700. Uh, this is for your, uh, for your banks. Most of them are not going to want to write you a note at under 700. If you find them who will do that, the, the terms will probably not be phenomenal. So you need a personal FICO over 700. Uh, something you guys can all do. This is something I, I do with everybody in our group and all of our, uh, uh, all of our clients who work with us. Uh, go to myfico.com. They have a premium service for 40 bucks a month. Pull out your credit card and buy it. Then it'll give you a phone app, and that gives you real-time evaluation of your FICO score. Your FICO score is not your credit score. Those are not the same thing. A FICO score tends to be a little bit higher, so that's nice. And there's a lot of different FICO scores. The one that most lenders will use in our industry is the FICO 8 score, and that is what myfico.com gives you. Uh, you'd have a different FICO score to go for, let's say, like an auto loan or something. It's, it's the same data, but it's different calculation. And when you go through that, you want to do whatever you have to do to get and keep that score as high as possible. You need your FICO score. Okay. All right. Second thing, you're going to need two to three years of tax returns for the guarantor and all relevant entities. So you guys should be doing businesses through your LLCs. You're going to need to provide tax returns, both your personal and your LLCs. And I want to see all that stuff. 
uh, a thing that I was taught to do, don't file your taxes on time. Always, always, always file an extension. And then at the very end of the extension, you do a paper uh, return, not an electronic return to make sure that uh, the quota for all the uh, audits has been handled. It was to minimize audit chance. Uh, that made a lot of sense to me early on. I, as far as I know, it's still good advice. Uh, but for what we're doing, looking to be able to quickly borrow funds and do a lot of transactions, it's really stupid. Don't do that. Uh, as of March 31st, have your taxes done or March 15th, whatever the, the LLC one is. File your returns, get everything finished. And as soon as you can, within a year, get those returns in. It doesn't matter if we owe the IRS money, we're gonna borrow a hell of a lot more off other people. So the uh, get your tax returns done as early in the year as possible. Anybody who wants to be a buyer for Coast to Coast is gonna to have to have the, will expect their 2021 returns finished uh, by the end of March. If they don't have them done, we'll just delay uh, trying to sell them anything because the lenders are gonna expect to see it. Uh, you're gonna need your personal financial statements. Uh, which is just a little one pager that's basically your net worth. Uh, every lender has some version of it. Uh, you guys can just Google it. It's a really simple document to come up with. Uh, you're going to need proof of funds and sourcing of funds. And this is for your full doc guys. Proof of funds means do you have the money? Sourcing of funds is where did the money come from? And what they're looking for is they want to know... Uh, they, they want to know that the money is not borrowed. So if you happen to, you know, maybe have borrowed the money, uh, for example, let's say you wanted to use your home equity line of credit to do it. You would need to do something we call season those funds. And that means it needs to go sit in a bank account somewhere as cash for two bank statements. So typically that would be something we did on the last day of the month. Like I would have done it today. So when my bank statement comes out on Monday, uh, that's the first month. And then in December, when it shows the next one, that would be my second month. I would show them my December statement that had that money in there for two statement cycles. And those funds would then be considered seasoned. There are lenders who do more than 60 days, but there's, uh, there's plenty of them that uh, only require 60. So if you're going to have to do sourcing of funds, that's a way to do it. Okay. There's a couple other little tricks too. Uh, Buy Mark dinner and he'll tell you how to do it. You should all put together your full doc package, meaning you want to know your FICO score, have your tax returns all bundled up in a nice digital format. I keep it in a folder on a shared drive and I'm ready to send it off to a lender at a moment's notice and keep it in uh, every six months or so, redo your PFS. All right. Uh, and uh, one more thing, you're going to need proof of relevant experience. That's usually a very easy one. Uh, if you are a rehabber, they're just going to want to see a couple of HUDs that show you did some rehabs before. If you're a buy and hold person, they just want to see a couple of deeds that show you owe some rental property. Not really a big deal. Uh, in bank world, the, uh, the, the bar for this is a bit lower. You're either experienced or you're not. Uh, hard money guys will base a lot of their terms on your experience. So if you can show yourself as experienced by their definition, uh, you'll end up getting a better deal. All right, low doc. Pretty similar uh, as far as FICO score. You are definitely getting a hard credit check, but a couple of things that comes in. Uh, they still want to see about a 680. Uh, they might be willing to tolerate a little lower, but you're not going to love it. So over 700 is way better. Uh, and 780 to 800 plus, that's, uh, that's when you're going to get your best terms. That is, you've, you've squeezed the hard money lender for all they're willing to give you if your FICO is that high. It's one of the number one things they care about is what is your FICO score. Uh, personal financial statements, uh, maybe. Some of them do, some of them don't. They want proof of funds, but not source of funds. For a lot of you, that is the difference between whether or not you even consider using a bank. If they don't ask for where the money came from, we can do the deal. If they do ask where the money came from, we got some splaining to do, and it might not be the kind of thing we want to do. And they care a lot about your experience, so proof of relevant experience. They're going to fully underwrite the asset. Uh, that actually should have been in full doc, too. What they determine, by the asset, I usually mean the property. What they determine is a good property versus a bad property varies a little bit by lender. 
I'll give you a few generalizations on this. First, they're going to order a third-party appraisal. Their valuation of the property is going to be a percentage of whatever that appraisal comes in at. So if I do my comps and it comes in at $100,000 and I turn that in as a lending package and we go through underwriting, uh, the lender is going to first ask me to pay for an appraisal if they like me and don't see any major red flags. I'm going to pay for that appraisal. I'm going to cut a check to the lender. The lender is going to order it. Uh, this is one of the slowest parts of real estate right now. So somewhere between three and six weeks later, we'll get an appraisal report back. Best case scenario, it comes in at the number I gave them, 100 grand. What can happen though, is it comes in a lot less. So I could, maybe the appraiser says it's $50,000. Well, I'm left with two choices at that point. Choice one, I can go back to the seller and try to convince them their property is worth half of what I offered them. Choice two is I can bring all the difference to closing out of my own pocket. Both cases tend to suck. So most of the time, if a deal doesn't appraise well enough, it kills it. The deal will fall through. Uh, you will lose the cost of your appraisal because that person was already paid. The other thing that gets looked at, especially in my world, where we're looking at uh, income generating passive income properties is called the uh, DSCR, or the debt service coverage ratio. And that is how much money the property generates versus its expenses. Most lenders want to see that at a 1.25 or higher. And all that means is that the property makes 25% more in income than it costs to run it. When all expenses, including the mortgage payment they are considering giving you is factored in. All right. So that is your uh, full doc and low doc stuff. Uh, let's talk about types and notes. So let's let's look at the different types of products that are out there. There's a ton of them. These are just a few more general ones that you guys are going to deal with on a, a regular basis. Uh, Long-term notes. Uh, these are for holding property. This is uh, you you own one of these for your own personal rev uh, residence. Uh, and those run anywhere from a two to a 30 year. There is such thing in commercial world as a 40 year amortizing mortgage. It's a thing. We don't see it very often, but it is a thing. So 20, uh, anywhere between two and 30 year long mortgages. Uh, that amortization schedule may balloon, meaning it may end sooner. So I might have a 30 year uh, mortgage, but it might have a five year balloon, meaning that I will pay it down every month as if I had 30 years to pay it off. But in five years, the whole balance becomes due, due and the note ends. So I'll either have to pay it off in cash or refinance to a different product. Uh, these risks, these are, uh, this is from the point of view of the lender. I took this out of another presentation I did. So long-term notes are pretty low risk. Uh, you get a middling reward for them. I mean, they can't charge huge double-digit returns. It just doesn't work. Uh, and their competition is, you know, bank financing at like two, three, four percent. And this is the most uh, passive thing. The 30-year mortgage-backed security uh, is only available in the United States, and it is a favorite of banks worldwide. It's it's the, one of the number one money-making vehicles on the planet. So long-term mortgages are good food. Our institutional guys absolutely love it. Then we got midterm notes. Uh, this is what a lot of you guys are doing. Uh, these last anywhere between about six months and two years. They are high risk and they are pretty high reward. Risk and reward are a law of economic nature. So the high risk is from market volatility, but mostly from construction. The construction projects are where we take our risk in real estate. The bigger the construction project, the more likely something is going to go wrong. That is not necessarily a reflection of you or your experience, though it can be. Uh, a lot of that is out of our control. What happens if the local municipality decides that their entire permitted office isn't coming back from uh, uh, COVID for another three months? You will have to sit there and wait. Uh, and you're just going to have to hold on everything. So it's a, that's a high risk, right? Uh, they don't know what the market's going to do, though it's just going up. You could have various issues there. So it is a higher risk type note from a lender point of view. Uh, then we have short-term notes. Uh, these are a little bit more rare. There's a, a specific business models are required to uh, 
actually need them on a regular basis. Uh, they ask last anywhere from, I have in here three days, but it can actually be three hours. It, it can be less than a day. Uh, and generally they don't last more than six months. They're low risk and high reward, and they are the least passive from a lender point of view. This is usually called transactional lending or transactional funding. It's used for double closing and it's used in business models like mine at coast to coast, where we buy something in cash, uh, stabilize it and then sell it immediately. So most of those properties have already been sold and we're just waiting for the long-term financing to come in. So it's a, it's a, just a bridge until we get through the, to the actual product we want. And in the meantime, we pay a lot more to hold it. So when you guys are looking at your own business model, you should be pretty clear about what type of financing or what types of financing you're going to want to be using. Uh, and what should you be expecting as far as the uh, risk profile on those? All right, long-term notes. This is how banks make all their cash. Uh, we got tons and tons of options out there. There, there is no shortage of people who will write you a 30-year mortgage. Uh, first position, th this is for uh, private capital. This is not reflecting what a bank does. But if you're going to do it privately, it's uh, about 2% higher than the banks, probably about 5 to 7% at the moment. Like I said, there's a lot of downward pressure here. Uh, just based on when we're doing these kind of uh, private mortgages, uh, we're usually doing it for rental property. So we can only pay is enough money. We have, we have to keep the payment low enough that we still have cash flow. So there is a limit. You can't magically decide you want to pay 13 instead just to get the deal done. It's not going to work. Uh, so the deal only allows so much uh, interest to be paid. Uh, second position, when you do a mezzanine position on a long-term note, uh, we're going to have to have a higher return than first. We pay 6 to 9% for our own. And it has the exact same limitations as uh, the, the first position there. The, uh, the cash flow determines how much we're able to pay. Um, most decent cash flow properties you would pick up today, not all, but most, uh, will not be able to handle a double-digit interest rate. It's going to be too high. You, you won't be able to get to 10 even nine pushes it on a lot of these. The deal simply will not generate enough income to be able to afford it. Uh, Midterm notes. This is usually rehab stuff. So a lot of you guys are doing these. Uh, risk is in the construction and issues with the sales like we talked about. Uh, first position with private money runs anywhere from 10 to 14% currently. Uh, second position is way higher and they can take you to the cleaners if they want. I put 12 to 24 in here, but I've seen 30. If the second position is going to allow you to have no skin in the game, they can uh, take as much as they want out of the deal, as long as it still makes sense. Uh, preferred equity is also an option. This is, let's see, how do I want to say this? Your institutional lenders and your hard money lenders are not going to want a second position mortgage. They're not going to want mezzanine debt. They're not going to want a subordinate mortgage. They don't like them. Even if they tell you they'll do them, they don't like it. Uh, it's like asking them to eat something they don't like. You can just see the look on their face. They, they despise that idea. What they will let you do, though, is have what's called a preferred equity partner. And that is someone who will come on the LLC, take equity in the project and in the property, and that individual can then bring capital to the deal. And they can bring enough money to cover a lot or even the entire gap in that uh, capital stack. That's called preferred equity. We treat those people as lenders because they can either have a cut of the profit or treat them just like they're a lender and they get their percentage of uh, interest. Generally, if you're the lender, you want the interest. It's the guaranteed payday where the profit shares a maybe. And stability is a big deal in lending world. Okay. Uh, the catch with doing this, guys, is it's dollar per dollar and the bank or hard money lender is going to want to do full underwriting on anyone who owns 20% or more of the entity. So if your hard money lender is giving you 75% of the deal, you have to come in with 25%. You find a private equity partner who is willing to do that 25%, you would have to give them 25% of the uh, entity in order to get away with it. And the bank is then going to want their tax returns and hard credit checks and all that. Most of the time, lenders aren't willing to do that. So you may have to play some games there. Talk to your friendly neighborhood, Mark Abramovich, to figure out how it's going to work. But preferred equity 
uh, is a great way to go about it. We do preferred equity positions all the time in my business. It's a very, very common way uh, to secure your lender and protect them. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's, uh, it's, it's, I don't want to say better than a mortgage, but it's extremely comparable to the mortgage. All right, short-term notes, the transactional ones. Uh, we use these every day in Coast to Coast. They're used in specific types of transactions and to double close. So not everybody does these. Not all of you are going to ever need this kind of financing. Uh, first position from a private lender is going to run 9 to 12%. Uh, second position is just a wee bit better. It's uh, because these are relatively low risk compared to other types. It's about the same. You guys can get first position on this very easily. Uh, transactional funding is one of the easiest loans in the world to get. It's very, very simple. Um, best transactional funding is a, a first position we use a lot for that. They're great. They're absolutely lovely. Uh, they're same day only though. So you have to be able to use the, the capital and get it back to them in one day. And that's for a double close situation. Some of you guys doing wholesale deals, that's going to make sense to you. You'll, you'll need a double close for the particular transactions you're doing. If you don't need to double close, don't do it. It's expensive. All right. The nightmare of all lenders is something called monetary vacancy. When a lender's funds are not out, they're not making cash. In fact, they're bleeding it. They're losing inflation every minute of every day. So they want to look for pipelines like I said, I just took this out of another presentation I did, so I'm, I'm changing the context just a little bit. Lenders are looking for borrowers who are able to borrow off them again as soon as it's done. That's what they really want. They want the easy button. They really want to be lazy about this. So for example, a typical rehab loan at uh, six months at 12% interest, but then if it takes that same lender three months to find the next uh, loan to write that capital into, their total return for that year is 9%, not 12, minus what inflation did to them. And depending on which uh, CPI you choose to use, that would mean they either made about uh, 3%, if we use what the Fed tells us today, uh, pretty close to zero and broke even if they use 1980, and they're in the hole about 5% if they use uh, the uh, first one. So your lender will decide how bad that is. Uh, construction is the risk on these. Uh, lenders want to avoid funding construction most of the time. Uh, hard money lenders will specialize in it, though, so they don't really avoid it too much. They, they don't mind as much. Uh, upside down deals. This is something you guys should all take into account, uh, especially if you're new. Try not to do an upside down rehab. That is a renovation where the value of the renovation or the cost of the renovation is higher than the purchase price of the property. We, we really don't love doing those. So if you can avoid it, it's not always going to be possible. Uh, you, you don't really want to do a ton of upside down ones. Those are where we get into some trouble and lenders don't like them as much. Consider them slightly more experienced uh, projects to get into. Uh, lots of variables outside of the borrower's control, permits, subcontractors, materials, inspections, all that stuff. And it all translates to uh, you may not make enough money to pay your lender back. So construction is where the risk is, all right? Uh, securing the position. This is something that uh, other education companies never taught. So I, I have it in my presentation for you guys. You, you should all, if you're only going to write down one thing, write down this. Uh, these are the documents that you have to have before you write a private loan. These are the documents you should have in order to take a private mortgage. So if somebody who has no idea about real estate says they are happy to be your private money lender, that's great. You want to give them every single document in this little list, okay? Now, before I show you the list, uh, let me share something with you guys that, that JJ and I talk about a lot. There is a responsibility to borrowing private capital. And it's very different than if we borrow from a bank or a hard money lender. If I borrow from a bank and I default on the loan, They'll financially destroy me. They'll take back their asset and they'll move on like nothing happened. I'm a blip in the radar. I don't matter. They don't care. Nobody gets hurt. Pretty much the same thing happens to a hard money lender. They're slightly more annoyed, but the outcome is about the same. If we lose the money of a private lender, we've probably lost their retirement account or their home equity line of credit. We have screwed them horribly. You might as well have stolen it off them. So that's a huge responsibility to take on. 
Now, you're not going to hear this in a lot of places, guys. We just hear, go ahead and, you know, if you find somebody to lend you the money. Here's the reality of the situation, though. When you borrow that money, you need to pay it back. Doesn't matter that the deal lost cash. It doesn't matter that you, if you are not willing to take out a personal loan, beg, borrow, steal, and financially destroy yourself to pay back every single petty of that, no matter how long it takes, don't borrow it. You're not ready. If you're not in a position to be able to do that, don't borrow it. Go find somebody else. Okay. So huge, huge responsibility. I hope you all take that very seriously. Please don't use anything we teach you to convince somebody to lend you money and not pay them back. As real estate investors, if you do enough deals, you're going to lose money on one. That's not a question. It's, it's just the reality of our business. We succeed a percentage of the time. And that percentage is high enough for us to generate an insane net worth and retire very happy. But you will lose money. And when that happens, basically makes or breaks you in this network. Makes or breaks you in my eyes and JJ's eyes and anybody else who does this business regularly. I don't care if you had a deal go south. That's fine. In fact, take it as a badge of honor. I consider you a newbie until you lost money on something. How you make your lenders whole decides whether basically what kind of person we believe you are from then on out. And once you burn that bridge, uh, once you screw over your lenders, you're, there's no coming back from that. Nobody can ever trust you again. You're going to need to change your name and go to a new network or you're basically done in this business. So private money is a responsibility. Pay it back, period. All right. You're going to have a promissory note. That's basically the contract that says uh, how long the mortgage is going to be, how much you're going to pay them, what address they're lending on. It's all the terms. It's usually a couple of pages. First page has all the stuff as a borrower that we care about. And then the next couple of pages are all the nasty, horrible things they get to do to you if you don't pay them. Uh, hopefully, none of you ever have to find out what those things are. Second thing is a mortgage. This is what gets recorded at the uh, local courthouse for that asset and says, hey, there's a, it just says, hey, there's a note on this property, at this address, blah, blah, blah. It's the public thing. It's a lot shorter. And that's what protects you and gives you that hard asset based lending. Uh, we do a confession of judgment. Different, uh, different states may have a different terminology for this, but in essence, uh, if this goes to court, you're already pleading guilty. You don't get the fight. Assignment of leases. If it is an income generating property and there is a default on the note, the lender immediately gets all the cash flow. They get to seize it and they will get to do so until it is solved. Lender title insurance. This is available for your first position only. So you second position guys will not be able to get this. Uh, but it, it's uh, this protects the lender in case there are title issues that come up after closing. Uh, a very simple but very important thing to do. And last, and both least and not least, is the personal guarantee. And that's very simply a piece of paper. It says, hey, I'm borrowing this money. And I, Brian Fine, personally swear that I will pay it back. Not my entity, not some other individual, me. You're lending it to me, I'm going to pay it back. From a legal standpoint, the personal guarantee has the least weight. It barely matters. From a relationship standpoint, it's the most important thing. That is your personal promise that you're going to pay it back. And that is why no matter what your contract says, no matter what your lawyer managed to squeeze into the loan docs, no matter what trickery or terrible things happen to you that cause that uh, loss on a transaction, you personally promised to pay back every penny. And so you're on the hook for it. I hope you all get that. Uh, we've seen far too many people uh, unfortunately take what we teach as far as marketing and, and deal structure and everything else and use it to convince some very, very good people to uh, lend to them on transactions. Something goes wrong and then they don't make it right. They don't pay them back. They, they stop returning calls. We, we have horror stories about that. That's terrible stuff. We, we never want to see that. If you are not ready to make it right in the event of a loss, please do not borrow private capital. Just don't do it. All right. Super borrower. This is what you all want to be. You want to turn into one if you can. Uh, it has taken myself and my business partners the better part of 10 years to do this. So if you guys can do it faster, good on you. You need to be experienced in the transaction type. Uh, when I, that's experienced by the standard of the lender. Uh, most of the time, they're looking for three or four deals in the last 24 months of the same type. So if I say I'm a rehabber and I can prove that I did three or four rehabs in the last two years, that'll usually satisfy them. 
If I say I'm a buy and hold investor and I bought a few hundred rental properties in the last six months, that probably qualifies too. So whatever it is, be experienced in that transaction type. Don't let it be your first rodeo. Here's a huge one. This is one that almost nobody has. I leverage this pretty brutally to get private capital, uh, even though we'd have basically competition for it. Uh, we have the assets to cover the note. What that means is we do not need the private money, or we don't need the money at all. We don't even need a lender to do the deal. We can do the deal in cash. We're only borrowing the money because it makes sense. And so we can scale and do more. This, especially with private lenders, makes them very happy. Uh, with our institutional lenders, uh, this lets us show a fairly ridiculous amount of reserves. It doesn't quite get us a rubber stamp, but it usually makes getting a loan very, very simple. Uh, we're showing that if the deal went in to totally south, if everything went wrong and it was 100% loss, we could simply write a check to our lender and make it okay. So if you can get to that position, that's a powerful place for you guys to be. Uh, this deal should be a low percentage of current business. Uh, this one could go either way. This is this is from my point of view. Uh, for you guys, you might you might be able to spin it differently and might have a different opinion. Um, in my business, we do large volume transactions. So at any given time, I'm doing 100 to 150 uh, units of transactions, uh, meaning that any given property makes up a very small part of what we're doing. So even if that particular deal went bad, we have so many other ones going on right now that it would just simply cover it. We'd still be profitable and our lenders would be taken care of. Another way you can spin this, and it would be a very good argument in either direction, would be the opposite. And it would be, this is the only deal you're doing. That would be especially important if you're a rehabber, maybe, uh, to say that, hey, this deal gets 100% of my focus and I won't be doing anything else till it's done. So you could take that either way. Uh, and pitch that to your uh, lender and lend different lenders will probably have a different opinion on what version of that they'd like to see. Do they want you doing a lot where they just make up a little bit of it or do they want 100% of your focus on the project that they are invested in? Uh, the subject asset have, has to have equity. Uh, something one of my mentors said is you can't fake equity. And it is so true. Very simply, guys, it has to be a deal. Don't invest in stuff that's not a deal. And if you're borrowing private money and they don't know how to check the value, don't borrow their money for something that isn't a deal. If there isn't enough meat on the bone, don't do it. Uh, the borrower has to have an excellent reputation. Uh, this goes to the little rant that I just said a minute ago about pay everybody back. The most experienced guys in th this network are all going to have stories about how we lost money. And the punchline of all those stories is we made our lenders whole. All the cash we borrow, I pay back every single penny. I have a 100% repay history, a really good one. Guys, have that history for yourselves and don't let anything take it away. Make sure your lenders get made whole. You can always go do more deals. You can always make more money. But if you ruin your reputation by screwing over one lender, you're done. So don't do that. Protect it. Uh, borrower has to be transparent and answer all questions, all of them, including some that you might find not cool. They're writing a check, so you don't have to. They can ask you anything they want. Answer them. Uh, this is for private lenders. For institutional lenders, let me give you guys a slightly different policy. They can ask you anything they want, only answer the question. And it is okay to answer their question with another question. As an example, they might say, ask me something and I might say, how do you want me to show you that instead of trying to answer it? Okay? Don't do that to your private lenders. Whatever they ask to see, you just show them. And we talked about monetary vacancy a couple of minutes ago. You want to have the volume to keep their investments going. If you are a rehabber, your perfect world, you have your private capital partner who funds your deal. You get that rehab done. You get it under contract. It's pending sale. You know it's going to close in about 30 days. You put your next property under contract for a closing within a few days of that. So as soon as your rehab closes, you pay back your lender and immediately roll their capital into the next transaction. That's your perfect world, right? And buy and hold world, it's a little easier. We just go buy more of them. We don't ever, ever stop. But the point is that if we have somebody who wants to give us private money, we want to keep that private money in play, paying them interest as many days of the year as we possibly can close to 365 as you can pull off, all right? They don't want their money back. Don't give it back. If they do want it back, get it back to them as fast as you can. So that's a super borrower, guys. That's how that works. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit more here. I'm almost done about uh, private cash. Uh, so this is about uh, where the money comes from. Uh, private lending is the ideal vehicle for your retirement accounts. There's a bunch of reasons that are beyond the scope of this call. We don't like using the uh, retirement accounts to buy real estate. Uh, it's best used to lend, uh, take, take out notes that are backed by real estate. It's a cleaner move to make. Uh, so everybody on this call should be having those retirement accounts and getting the tax benefits from them. Uh, and then the best way to grow those, at least in our arrogant opinion, is you should be lending that. Uh, so everybody has the opportunity to be a lender. It's the perfect vehicle uh, for doing private money. Uh, you have to do an arm's length transaction, meaning you can't lend it to yourself. So you will be lending this to somebody else. Uh, other sources of cash. Uh, cash itself is a great life choice. If you have money sitting in a bank account, you can, you're can you losing right now. Inflation is killing you. Uh, your uh, your money market accounts and your, your savings accounts are probably under 2% annually. Uh, so just according to the Fed today, you're, you're just bleeding cash. Uh, so take that money and put it to work, right? Most private uh, lending situations you would get into are going to be in the uh, eight, nine percent. A lot of them are going to be in double digits. Uh, home equity lines of credit. We got lots of lenders who do this. It's a great life choice. If you have equity in your property, you're living there, you're not doing overly much with it. You can pull that, uh, access that capital, lend it out and get a return on the arbitrage of your own equity. So it's kind of beautiful. It's literally money from nothing. That's a great way to do it. Uh, cash out refinance of an existing property, whether it's your own personal residence or a, a, another asset, you can just take a check out of there and just go invest it. Uh, stocks, bonds, cryptocurrency, all that other fun stuff. Uh, if the volatility is getting to you and you want to get something that will reliably keep your head above water and above inflation, uh, switch it over to real estate based. And I don't think I have to convince anybody on this call that that's a good idea. Uh, money partners. Uh, this is the the other source of capital, uh, both for your own deals and for everybody else's. If you don't have the money or you're not bankable, your credit score sucks, or maybe your credit score is great, but you have zero income, uh, retiree, that kind of thing, have a high debt to income ratio. It's going to be rough for you to personally get a loan. Uh, so go find somebody who doesn't have that problem and bring them into a deal. It's the easiest answer there is. All right, guys. JJ, that ends my little presentation for the evening. That's my little rant on uh, how to make your lenders love you. <laughs>